Welcome to the 27th UC Berkeley Cloud Computing Meetup. We're beginning to develop uh, quite a bunch of these now in a row, and we're coming to uh, actually a topic that we um, initially checked in on a little more than a year ago. Uh, so um, let me just tell you a little bit about that. So we have Camille Crittenden here, who's gonna focus on the Pacific Research Platform. And I will chat in a little bit the link to the old presentation She'll be joined by Chris Hoffman, and they're gonna talk about what they learned over the six year uh, life cycle of this grant funded project. And I think we're going to see a film, which is a first for the cloud, cloud meetup. Uh, and so I'll start um, before we dive into that with announcements. And so if this is also open, so if anybody has announcements that you'd like to make, please, um, you can either chat them or jump right in. Because as you can see, it was a spare month for our own announcements. Although I did hear a rumor that Jody um, Couch from IST was hosting the Educause cloud um, meeting, which was focused on research IT. So if anyone here went to that, um, would be interested to, to hear how that went. And we will, uh, we will share the link to all the recordings of those. So in case you missed it, you'll be able to hear it. I'll make a quick announcement. Um, so this is Amy from Research IT. Um, I think some of you know that we are working quite a bit on developing a platform for researchers who are working with sensitive data. And we are in the process of rolling that out right now. It's called the SRDC, Secure Research Data and Compute. So if you are a researcher or if you are somebody who is supporting uh, researchers who are working with sensitive data, please send them our way. Um, we will have a upcoming cloud meetup focused on SRDC. So there'll be plenty of opportunity to learn more, but I um, just wanted to give everyone a heads up about that. And I will drop a link in the chat. Great. There's the mute button. Um, great. So actually back to you, Amy, for the poll. Yes. So let's do a little poll before we get started. And thanks to Camille for helping us come up with these questions. Um, so please, on your devices, go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And it's going to ask you to enter a code. So please enter 748703. I'll put that code in the chat as well. Um, so first, we like to ask, what part of the community are you from? To get a feel for who is in the room. So please let us know. We keep adding more options every month because our community is growing, which is awesome. And actually, Tara, I think we might have put the wrong link. Oh, there we go. There it is. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're perfect. Thank you so much for driving. So it looks like we have a lot of Berkeley IT staff, quite a few staff. We have some guests here, which is awesome. Welcome to our guests. See, we have a student. I might have seen a couple students here. So great. Nice. Welcome, everybody. Great to see this nice mix. All right, let's go on to the next question. So I help move large data sets to off campus compute or storage facilities often, occasionally, or almost never. Interesting, interesting. Looks like a lot of almost never, which is fascinating. Some occasional. I see some other research IT folks on the call here. I'm surprised um, not seeing the often because we do quite a bit of that in research IT. All right, nice. This gives us a good idea of who's in the room and what kind of work you're doing. Um, let's move on to the next one. So the Pacific Research Platform is an instrumented barge parked off the coast of California to measure ocean temperature and pollution, a tool to measure how calm and peaceful the staff are throughout the semester, or a high-speed broadband network to facilitate data-intensive science. All right, we're seeing a lot of answers on the high-speed broadband network. Y'all read the description and know about PRP. That's great. Spoiler alert. Yep. 
<laughs> well, very nice, everyone. Very nice. All right, and one more. Go on to the next one. What word best describes your primary feeling going into the fall semester? Seem excited and exciting. Hopeful, some anxious, some worried, some enthusiastic, resilient, optimistic, ready. I like that. The ambivalent over there. It's fun to watch this. Hopeful, anxious, and excited, I think, are the big three here. That sounds about right. Excellent. Thank you very much for sharing that. Really appreciate all your participation. All right. So, Bill, would you like to introduce Camille and Jeff and Chris? Yes, let me uh, do that. Uh, so, uh, I'll introduce Camille, and we don't have Jeff's name on the slide here. So, um, Camille is the executive director of Citrus and the Banatao Institute, and she is the uh, co-PI on the Pacific Research Platform. Chris Hoffman is in research IT, and uh, together they, I think, will paint a picture of what happened with the Pacific Research Platform. So I heard a lot about this at the beginning, and I heard about it last May, and I'm really excited to hear the how the whole thing played out. So without further ado, uh, Camille, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Amy. Um, and yes, apologies that uh, Jeff Weekly's name is wasn't on the, the marquee here, too. I'm very grateful that he's here to help um, tell the story of the Pacific Research Platform. He's been a super important partner throughout the six years, um, first in his role at Merced and now in his role at Santa Cruz. So um, he's also going to present a few slides about his work and contributions to the PRP. So thank you everyone for hosting us. Um, we're really delighted to be here and give you the sort of final wrap up uh, update about the Pacific Research Platform. The other person I wanna call out is Mark Yashar, who has been also on the project from nearly the beginning and is also a colleague of folks at Research IT these days. And uh, he has been a super partner in helping to organize all of the activity on the Berkeley side um, for the PRP. So here's what I thought we would talk about. Um, I would just give you a little bit of the background and history of the project. Um, then Chris will say a few words um, from the research IT perspective, especially around cybersecurity, as you've been mentioning the um, secure research data and compute facility. Amy, I know uh, Chris has been involved in that as well. Um, Jeff will talk about the Nautilus and visualization applications, which has been his specialty. Um, and then we have a, a PRP video um, produced by the Citrus Multimedia team, uh, especially Adriel Olmos has done a terrific job in pulling all the various strands together um, for about an eight minute video that really tells the story quite nicely, I think with good visualizations. And I especially applaud him for doing it during COVID days when he couldn't go and personally interview uh, the PIs, but used a lot of B-roll and already captured interviews to put together a nice summary video. Then we'll leave a few minutes for questions and discussion and wrap it up. So here, uh, and we presented the PRP in the past as well, uh, so some of this might be familiar to, to many of you, but we started back in 2015 or so, and even I would say step zero before the NSF funding came through, I wanted to acknowledge that we did have some seed funding from the UCOP CIO office when Tom Andriola was CIO. So he gave us a small amount of money to write a proposal um, that ended up going to NSF as part of the DIBS um, program that some of you might also be familiar with. So the CC Star grants, it was part of that uh, whole program. Amy Walton was the program officer. Uh, and so we were able to secure funding. It was originally $5 million over five years. And then we um, had an expansion and extension that allowed us to go for six years. So Larry Smarr was the PI. I think he even presented in this forum um, maybe even a year ago, uh, a while back. Um, and then here are the other four co-PIs. 
Tom DeFanti at UC San Diego was um, quite instrumental in making sure that all the trains were moving smoothly and on time and also bore the brunt of the heavy reporting burden, as you might be familiar with the NSF projects, but um, he's done a great job in nudging all the many collaborators to send him their uh, data about their projects and contributions and use of the PRP. So you'll see that the vision was to help the NSF to maximize the investments that it had already made in the campus level science DMZs. Um, throughout the country, but there were a number of them here in California, of course. And so we wanted to use this really as a test bed to connect these science DMZs um, to really strengthen them and the connections between them so that we could get all the way to the last mile. So connect them from, you know, researchers' telescopes or microscopes or visualization facilities all the way to um, where the data might be stored and processed to the faculty member's office. So it was a lot about high speed, um, high bandwidth uh, data transfer. That was really the, the essence of the proposal. And we were gonna focus on a number of data intensive scientific areas um, that you'll hear about in just a few minutes. But this gives you a sense of sort of the original community. There were 25 or so participating organizations from the beginning. And then you'll see in the little box on the left, it had since expanded to you know probably 50 or more organizations um, that were participating in the PRP by the end. So here are some of the hardware uh, pieces that were also developed as part of the PRP. A lot of this really happened at San Diego. Um, John Graham, some of you might know, um, he was really the, the chief um, kind of architect and engineer behind the, the hardware. So they developed this um, special purpose data transfer node, this flash IO network appliance or Fiona. Um, and so there were many Fionas that were built and then distributed around different campuses and facilities throughout California and the Pacific region um, to help to facilitate this high speed data transfer. And then eventually, you know, the hardware evolves over five years. Five years is a long time in, in tech. And so we kept building on the new capacities that were available um, in the, the hardware. You'll see here, um, John Graham and his friends uh, often took these uh, road shows to visit in person and help to uh, install the machines on site in a number of these campuses. So you'll see Jeff there at the bottom um, featuring the one at UC Merced, but also our other partner campuses throughout UC in Santa Cruz and Santa Barbara Riverside and at Stanford. Building on the PRP, um, Tom and Larry and their colleagues also have written a number of proposals following up on that. And one of the more important ones is called Chase CI um, that was really adding this machine learning layer to be built on top of the PRP. So we were looking at the PRP not only as sort of a demonstration test bed, but what could it enable? Um, and so it was uh, adding new pieces of hardware and software um, that were being built on top of the PRP. And I'm sure that Chris and Jeff can uh, answer your more technical questions about that, um, but we're pleased that there have been a number of follow-on grants, including this one. Eventually, we wanted to connect not only in the Pacific region, and Scenic, of course, was an important partner in that. Um, you're probably aware of that uh, networking um, organization, the corporation, Oh, I'm going to get the acronym wrong uh, for networks in California. I forget what the E is, sorry. Um, so anyway, scenic in the Pacific region was important, but there are also other regional networks throughout the country that we wanted to connect to. Um, and then even internationally, as you see on, on this map and others that we are trying to connect all of those together, both in Europe and further out in the Pacific Rim and Singapore, Australia, and uh, other parts of the world. So again, here are some more of the um, sort of follow on grants that were proposed and led by Larry and partners mostly down at San Diego. The other partners are not only the nonprofit regional networks, but also Internet2, which serves the education community um, throughout the US. So they were also a good partner in all of this. So here are the main principles. 
that we wanted to create these uh, new technologies and and help to implement them within the Pacific research platform kind of ecosystem. Um, I mentioned the access to new hardware and adoption of new software systems. Um, looking at open source software pro projects. And again, um, Chris and Jeff can speak with more authority about, about some of those. Um, but also we did want to build the community and that's really what the Berkeley side of the PRP was all about was the science engagement. And so helping to contribute to the professionalization of research consulting in this respect um, and creating a community. There are weekly calls with PRP engineers um, you know, the science engagement team meets every other week and we hosted workshops and symposia and such. So we wanted to really put the word out there about what the PRP could do and be really a leading organization in the country about uh, research specific high speed networks. So looking also at ways that we could um, simplify the onboarding of hardware and projects and, and users for this kind of networking, build solutions and create sustainable models. So looking for the new collaborations who could um, help, who could understand, you know, sort of the goals and the operations of the system and to find new collaborators. We'll talk a little bit more about Nautilus and other um, features of that. And then uh, Tom DeFanti's analogy is the potluck supercomputing paradigm um, where the computing is quite distributed uh, but can accomplish uh, a lot as far as the number of um, GPUs or CPUs that are being used to do this computation. Looking at the science uh, areas that we had uh, originally set out to support, um, these are really the main ones. So looking at particle physics, that was Frank Worthwine's work for the most part, um, biomedical omics, genomics, proteomics, those kinds of applications. Looking at the earth sciences, we worked with folks at Scripps. I think that came up in the chat earlier uh, around extreme weather. Um, we tried to work with the peer group here at UC Berkeley around earthquake monitoring and prediction. Um, there are a number of telescope surveys that some, some worked out, some were farther off on the horizon than we had anticipated, um, but we got some great results and working with the, the telescope folks. And then the visualization and virtual reality, which Jeff will talk a little bit more about um, because he's really the expert in building these cave kiosks and wave facilities. Here are some of the emerging um, high priority PRP applications. And one that I'm really excited about to see where it can be built even further is in the wildfire monitoring and prediction. Um, so being able to use the uh, wireless networks, especially in the more remote regions of California to connect back to some of the PRP infrastructure, but to use that for the visualization and machine learning aspects of spotting wildfires um, before they get started and then sharing that data with the first responders. You'll see in the film, Ilkay Altentas at uh, UC San Diego was one who was really instrumental in developing this Wi-Fire wi application um, that's being used to support um, decisions around wildfire um, response in, in all parts of California. Looking also at the large scale scientific instruments, um, CASPER is a project here on campus related to SETI, the, um, looking for signs of life elsewhere in the universe, uh, but also visualizing the uh, galaxies and black holes that were part of the radio astronomy research that's happening here. Again, the biological applications and um, the imaging through um, the, the microscopes that um, has also been part of the, the campus work. Again, here are some of the visualization tools that were developed through the PRP to understand where a lot of this data traffic is coming from. And I realized that this uh, graph takes a little bit to digest, but what you're seeing here is an, a namespace application is a, is a project, a name of a project. Um, and you'll see the PI's names there in the boxes that are associated with them. Um, and the time scale here is across one year. So looking from at 2020 from January on the left to December on the right, uh, these are the different levels of intensity of usage of data transfer over the PRP. So I thought it was interesting if you look at the brown box in the bottom 
left corner, it says folding at home. You'll notice that's around March or so. And you'll recall that that's when everyone was at home. We were all sent home because of coronavirus and people were wanting to contribute to some of this research. And so that's the protein folding research that was happening then. So there's a little bubble of, of brown around that project there. Um, you'll see that large lavender band kind of in the middle. That's Frank Worthwine's work on Ice Cube that you'll hear more about in the video. I mentioned the workshops. We've had a number of them over the years. A couple were hosted at Montana State in Bozeman. A couple were hosted in San Diego uh, involving support again from the NSF and the Quilt, which is the collection of the regional networks. And some more workshops in the before days. You'll recognize a few familiar faces from Berkeley down there in the lower right corner. Um, but this is, this is what we've been up to over the last five or six years. As I mentioned, there are these weekly engineering Zoom meeting uh, calls. Some of you might have participated in some of those. Um, they're quite robust, and Tom takes very detailed notes. We'd be happy to share any of those with, with you if, uh, if there's particular interest in Mark also. Mark Yashar would have access to all of that. And then again, really trying to um, build the community across minority serving institutions, uh, tribal colleges and universities. And I think Chris is gonna talk a little bit more about that, um, those research and outreach uh, efforts. So with that, uh, I think I turn it over to Chris. Yeah, thank you, Camille. And I have some uh, annoying animations built in. So I'll ask you to, to click. <laughs> yeah, <and> please then. do. <laughs> so yeah, there. Uh, so hi, everybody. I'm Chris Hoffman. I'm the Associate Director for Research IT. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my experience with the Pacific Research Platform Project, which has just been such an exciting um, experience uh, in my career here at Research IT at, at UC Berkeley. I want to talk about this kind of from the perspective of, you know, I, I consider myself a research facilitator. I, I help research happen. I help research, researchers have access to the right kinds of resources. And when I saw the vision for the Pacific Research plan, uh, Platform be kind of described as, you know, connecting the science DMZs, creating a regional end-to-end, -end, you know, cyber infrastructure, I thought, Wow, that sounds cool. You know, what, what does that mean to me? And so if you, if you one more click there, Camille, this is how I translated it. To erase or make mostly irrelevant this kind of geographic separation between data and, and computing resources so that you know, researchers can do research. And to do this for as many fields as possible. This is something that was really for, important for me. It's like, how can we do this for astronomy, for archaeology? because all of these fields have exploding amounts of data that are being generated in novel ways. Uh, okay, slow down, slow down. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and similarly, they also have many similar kinds of research problems, right? So they're all dealing with images. Many of them are working with data that are, are highly sensitive and everybody's trying to containerize everything. And, and next click, please. Thank you. And check, check, check. The, the PRP in this in the five or six year grant has knocked all of these really out of the park. I mean, it's really done a phenomenal job of surpassing the expectations that were, you know, written into the proposal itself. Okay, next slide. So one of the success stories that, that I'd like to share with you is a cyber archaeology success story. And, and for the people who know me know that my, my background is actually as an archaeologist. That's what I did my PhD research in. And when the pandemic hit, you know, most excavations around the world stopped, but there was one that, that really relied on the PRP and, and the high-speed network in order to, to proceed. And this was a partnership between uh, UC San Diego and University of Haifa in Israel. And there's a great um, scenic blog, and we'll provide these slides, that, that gives a highlight about, that, you know, talks about this project. And that, that you know, I, I highlighted that you know, they were able to conduct the, the still hold the excavation, but they also drastically accelerated data analysis time. So let me actually read a couple of paragraphs. Oh, actually, sorry. Sorry, uh, for, for just one, one, a couple of sentences here from the article. You know, the researchers had planned to fly to Israel, but they would have had to actually stay in quarantine for like a month on either side. So instead the researchers conducted the, the, the Haifa researchers conducted the field work while the San Diego researchers helped process and analyze the findings. The Haifa researchers scuba dived at the site 
excavating and collecting artifacts, they wore GoPro cameras and they live streamed the data back to San Diego using the PRP where photogrammetry took place and images were processed to create 3D models so that the next day the San Diego researchers, Tom Levy and his team, could go into the lab and have you know, basically the, the, ont, the new data and new visualizations of the excavations as they were being done. So that's just such a great story of, of how the PRP and these other networks came together to support a research project. Next slide. So why am I excited about the future of the PRP? Click. So more examples like that. Cyber archaeology is, is that, that's something I'm very passionate about. But there are so many other fields where you see that the data volumes and the complexity of the data that are being generated and analyzed those are increasing, you know, in, in many cases exponentially. And the opportunities that are that can be realized by minimizing that geographic separation are really you know, kind of transformational. That's, that's still the vision. So I look forward to more examples of that. Click. Researcher to researcher. So we have enough people using the platform now that their researchers are talking to researchers. And there's a quote here from Alex Feltis. Many of us know him, he's at Clemson. He's kind of the poster child researcher who figures things out, finds his resources, puts them together, and then tells other people. And I love this question. Who knows what this guy's going to discover as he talks to, to a, a PhD student, right? I love that. Click. Or data visualization. And we're going to hear shortly from, from Jeff Weekly about his work in this space. Click. And I'm really excited to... to you know, this is going to be a great year at Berkeley. There's actually some really interesting movement on data movements, great progress. We'll continue to work with the PRP. We have a license here for, for Globus, which is a really enabling technology for data movement and data management. There's some great things happening in terms of improvements to the campus network and to some of the building infrastructure as well, including one that I'm very involved with, which is the, the NeuroHub, which is a research center, which is going to have some really high profile research and data movement taking place both in Wild Hall and in Warren Hall. Um, so that's very exciting. I look forward to working with you all on that. And one more click. And especially the thing I'm really looking forward to is there's a real emphasis now in the PRP in its next phase of existence to bring the power and potential of the PRP to a broader set of communities. So click. So, Camille showed a map where we've already done so much to bring the PRP across the United States. There's a, a national research platform. There's a global research platform that's evolving. And finally, click. But really, I think what's really exciting is broadening access for underserved and underrepresented communities you know, in our own home state and around the world. Um, so there's a lot of effort to really engage with other universities, whether it's the historically black colleges and universities, tribal colleges, minority serving institutions, um, or, or the, the EPSCOR, which stands for Established Program to Stimulate Competitive Research. I actually had to look that up. Um, but there's some really intentional engagement to say, like, let's see what we can do to bring these capabilities to more people than just kind of the, the high-end computing people who are, are, are calling for this right now. So with that, um, really excited to, to see what happens next. And I will turn it over to Jeff. Thank you, Chris. Well, thanks for having us. Um, thanks for inviting me, um, Bill, and uh, facilitating that, Camille. So, um, you know, as Chris alluded to, there are, uh, these visualization infrastructures around. The first one I ever laid eyes on was at uh, Cal IT2, now Qualcomm Institute at UC San Diego. And, you know, 15 years or so ago, um, I started building these myself. Um, and over the years I have built, um, I think I'm on my 15th one. Uh, the, this, this UC Merced wave was number 14 and we did one more in the library. And while the, the technology has gotten a lot easier, the challenges um, around uh, using these things and making them productive parts of your um, research ecosystem have not changed. Those are all still present. So just to go over quickly some features of the UC Merced Wide Area Visualization Environment or the WAVE, 
When we built it in 2016, it was the largest infrastructure of its kind in the world. Um, it was a prototype for the much larger Sun Cave down at uh, UC San Diego. Um, but for a while there, it held the world record for the most um, uh, pixels uh, viewable by any person at one single moment. Um, there's 20 stereoscopic displays that are um, driven by 10 dual GPU visualization servers. And the whole thing's connected together with 10 gig networking um, and using a very high powered single um, desktop as the head node. Um, it, it ran CalVR when we installed it, although we had it configured to run other kinds of software, commercial software, open source software. And eventually, um, after I did a little bit of network engineering, we got it connected to UC Merced Science DMZ and then on to the PRP. Um, but uh, next slide, please. But those challenges um, that I mentioned still exist. Um, even, even if this space was really active, it was really only used about four hours per week, or 10% of work hours. And for something that cost about $400,000 to, to build, um, it wasn't a great ROI. Um, when the engineers from UC San Diego help us set it up, um, they installed a lovely set of, of data. You're looking at um, the, the ceiling frescoes on a church in Italy here. And um, there's a lot of really rich content, but you can imagine showing that same content over and over for you know innumerable numbers of tours and it just got a little stale. So content is king and developing it is really, really hard. So if you, you know, are sending an archeological expedition out to the desert and you're collecting the kind of data that are needed to be able to generate some of the content for these large walls, you wanna be able to share it. Um, and, and at the time we just weren't really able to share it. Bug fixes, upgrades and system maintenance were really hard. Um, and as soon as we installed the thing, it sort of started to drift away from what the state of the art was. Um, remote from support from UC San Diego was, you know, it was great. They were always there when we needed them, but they were always down there when we needed them. And sometimes getting things um, fixed remotely uh, is very, very difficult. So there were some challenges um, uh, along this axis that, that uh, you know, we really worked to overcome, but it wasn't until we fully joined PRP and the Nautilus program that we really started to see some uh, light at the end of that tunnel. Next slide, please. So in 2018, the system was upgraded. We patched or we, we upgraded to CentOS 7. And at that time we installed Kubernetes, which is a container orchestration software. Um, and if you hear Larry talk, uh, he'll talk a lot about Kubernetes. Um, and so then instead of running the software natively on um, this cluster, we actually just configured the cluster to run Kubernetes and the containers all spawned automatically. Um, at the same time, whenever we fired up um, the system, content um, from a central repository hosted at UC San Diego was downloaded dynamically. So if a researcher at UC San Diego added content or maybe somebody at the Hearst Museum in Berkeley added content or I pushed content um, up over the PRP into the, into the archive, when we fired up the system, it was there immediately available. So as soon as we tapped into PRP and Nautilus, we had um, an exponentially larger amount of data to explore. And that's really important when you're showing a system like this to researchers who really have never had such an instrument. They need to have a rich set of examples and they need to be able to see for themselves what this kind of technology could do for their own research. So having a deeper window into others' research is really helpful there. Um, nope, not quite yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So we always got the latest stable software loaded automatically direct from the um, software repository. It's loaded as a, an image into the containers and it was a one click operation for people. And if there were bugs or updates that were needed, we didn't really have to worry about 
shutting the system down for maintenance. We didn't have to set maintenance windows. We didn't have to, you know, do an all hands on deck uh, upgrade so we could get all 10, 11 machines upgraded simultaneously. They were just always running the latest software, um, the latest release from the developers down in San Diego every time we launched the system. And you can imagine running con complex infrastructure like that was really a benefit for us. It really relieved a lot of the systems administration duties for the team there at UC Merced. And it meant that even non-experts could start and run the system. It really was a one-click um, button. Um, and in fact, it got so easy that undergrads could lead tours. And we did um, a, uh, a digital magazine that um, undergraduate students could load up on an iPad and it would give them information about the content that they were seeing so that they didn't have to memorize everything. And they would have all the correct facts and figures right there at their fingertips. And as I mentioned before, um, it certainly simplified the systems administration and made it so that um, we didn't have to maintain this complex set of software. We just had to make sure that the machines were uh, turned on and they were connected to the network. And the bonus was um, when the machines weren't being used in visualization, I could walk into that lab and they were happily humming away because those 22 graphics cards were also part of the Nautilus system. So when I wasn't using them, someone on the PRP was. And I could go to my administration and say, wow, what a great investment you've made here. Look at all the science that this um, infrastructure is enabling. It's really, really worth it, isn't it? Um, and so it solved the ROI issue. It solved the white elephant issue. Um, and I, I loved it to walk into that space and, and hear those machines going. Um, so that's, I think, all I have to say about how my life was made so much better by the PRP and especially by uh, the Nautilus uh, platform. Um, I would do it again in a heartbeat. So here just a few other slides related to the uh, topics that you were talking about. Um, there are probably self-explanatory um, looking at some of these other applications and, and software. And the Fiona's that I had mentioned, uh, finally up to 180 Fiona's. Um, okay, so if we have time, this uh, video is about eight minutes long. Um, Amy and Bill, what would be your preference? Would you like to show the video or do you want to save the time? Um, I haven't been monitoring the chat because I've been sharing my screen, but um, we could either have a discussion or we could screen the video now. What do you think, Bill? I'm, I'm interested to see the video, but what do you think, Bill? I would say, um, unless there's questions, let's do what Jeff says and roll the video. And if people have questions, put them in the chat and we'll try to dispatch them as quick as we can before two o'clock. Yeah, sounds good. So you have the link to the video, I think, if you guys can run it from your side. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm not hearing sound yet. There's that setting, Amy, I think, where you have to like use the original sound. Pardon me. The data revolution is transforming fields as diverse as astronomy, archaeology, and earth sciences. This work depends on and is stored as trillions of data points. Today's data-intensive scientists need to quickly and easily store, analyze, and move these large data sets between collaborator labs, supercomputer centers, scientific instruments, and data repositories. Just as the high-speed end-to-end no-stop-lights interstate highway system transformed the American economy and social mobility in the 20th century, 
the Big Data Cyber Infrastructure of the National Science Foundation funded Pacific Research Platform promises to transform scientific advancement in the 21st century. The PRP's superhighways with network speeds from 100 to 1,000 times faster than commodity internet are provided by regional optical networks such as Scenic in California and its partner networks nationally and internationally. PRP's on-ramps to these optical fibers are rack-mounted PCs, each containing powerful multi-core CPUs, up to eight gaming graphics processing units, and large amounts of storage. Many of these PRP endpoints are drop-shipped to remote campuses, but in California, our UC San Diego technical team used the old-fashioned road trip to visit and install rack-mounted big data endpoints at campuses from UC Santa Cruz to UC Santa Barbara to Stanford University, to UC Merced, and back down to UC Irvine and UC Riverside. Internationally, these PRP endpoints span from Korea to the Netherlands. In the United States, there are over 180 of these big data PCs located and operational on 25 partner campuses, 10 of which are minority serving institutions. California is home to the largest number of PRP campuses. Pacific Research Platform users place their application in software containers. And then the PRP uses Google's open source Kubernetes to orchestrate the movement of these containers across the distributed PRP system or into commercial clouds. Because of PRP's aggressive containerization and high-speed networking strategy, to the user, the PRP's over 7,000 CPU cores, 500 GPUs, and 4,000 terabyte storage appear to be in the same room, while being interconnected by Scenic, the Quilt, and Internet2. The PRP is uniquely designed for working with multi-campus science teams from a wide range of application disciplines. Let's look into three examples of the over 400 projects actively using the PRP. Neutrino Observatory Data Analysis, Networked Virtual Reality Systems, and Prediction of Wildfire Spreading. A major use of the PRP is data analysis of the massive digital output of observatories. For instance, the National Science Foundation South Pole Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory is designed to detect astrophysical neutrinos. Spheres containing digital photosensors are attached to vertical strings, which are lowered into the boreholes, where they are frozen in ultra-transparent Antarctic ice. When a neutrino that has traveled across intergalactic space collides with an ice atom's nucleus, it creates a charged particle producing a cascade of blue light, which is detected by thousands of ice cube photosensors. The data analysis of when each of the photosensors detects the blue light provides information on the direction in space that the neutrino came from. Graphics processing units compute millions of photons propagating through the ice. The neutrino data is sent to the University of Wisconsin-Madison Ice Cube team, who then runs high-throughput computing on the Open Science Grid (OSG), a global distributed system of over 140 computer clusters. The OSG can in turn request usage of the PRP's GPUs. By mid-2020, IceCube data analysis was using nearly half of PRP's 500 GPUs for months at a time. Moving to the second example, modern archaeology is able to capture 3D digital movies on location and convert them into virtual realities. The PRP enables 3D high-resolution images of the ruins of Luxor in Egypt captured by UCSD PRP team to be shown on the UC Merced wave by pulling the data from UCSD over the PRP to Merced. The same Luxor dataset can be viewed on two other virtual reality systems, Qualcomm Institute Sun Cave on the UC San Diego campus, or the Citrus Cave Kiosk, inspired by the Cave Kiosk in the Hearst Museum of Anthropology on the UC Berkeley campus. These virtual reality systems are powered by the PRP PCs, which provide nearly 100 of PRP's 500 GPUs, available in standby mode to support the PRP applications such as IceCube data analysis and machine learning. A final example is this public service PRP application developed in response to destructive wildfires becoming the new normal in California. With support from the National Science Foundation over 20 years, the High Performance Wireless Research and Education Network and its partners built out meteorological stations and hundreds of cameras across Southern California. Those sensors constantly stream data into PRP's big data PCs, 
which are connected by optical fiber networks to the San Diego Supercomputer Center. There, these second-to-second -second data updates are integrated with detailed topography and fuel load by the NSF-funded Wi-Fi cyber infrastructure to better equip emergency responders to model and predict fire behavior using real-time data sources and machine learning models. The director of Cal IT2, Larry Smarr, and the chief data science officer at San Diego Supercomputer, Elkai Altintosh, put those pieces together so how you can make the technology and the hardware and the simulation and data science integrated into a platform that can be seamlessly intuitive to firefighters and the public. When you think about a location and time that the fire starts, there is a number of data that you can bring together. If you could bring together all the data, you can actually enable fast decision support using models, data science, fire science. So that's what Wi-Fi achieved. Field resources initially are very limited. We'll run a model, the initial model, here from the center, and with the capability of the program, we can put it in a shared file. I could take a picture of the screen, whatever means possible to be able to get it to those initial decision makers that are out in the field because they're making decisions on what's a realistic containment area for this fire, if, if at all possible, where are we gonna be able to stop it? The Pacific Research Platform has convened annual workshops in 2017, 2018, and 2019 attended by hundreds, including the leaders of the major national networking organizations, ESNet, Internet2, and The Quilt. We held workshops for minority-serving institutions and NSF under-resourced EPSCOR states and invited their leadership speakers to increase inclusion and diversity in the PRP communities. In addition, the PRP team has attended major technology conferences, such as the annual supercomputing and scenic meetings. The science engagement team has also created smaller on-campus workshops to engage new members. Providing technical training and expanding our growing PRP community continues to be a central focus of the PRP grant, with both in-depth technology courses, weekly technology video meetings, and detailed documentation on how to get started in the PRP website. To accelerate the rate of scientific discovery, researchers must get the data they need, where they need it, and when they need it. Join the community, collaborate at the speed of light, and unlock tomorrow's discoveries. To get involved, visit pacificresearchplatform.org. So while the credits roll here, I just want to say again, uh, thank you to Adriel Olmos, who was the chief um, documentarian here who put it all together. And he also did the voiceover work. And uh, Julie Sammons, who's also on the call, um, put in many hours um, for supporting this project, among others, with the PRP. In our wrap-up symposium that we held in June, our program officer, Amy Walton from the NSF also participated and uh, she was quite pleased with how the video turned out. So we're hoping also that it will get some traction among the NSF directorates um, to, to show the fruits of the investments over the last six years.
It's a fantastic video. Thank you, Camille. Yeah, thank you. They did a nice job. Let's take a peek at chat and see if anybody has any questions. As usual, feel free to unmute if you like or put them in chat. We have just a couple minutes. Or reactions to the video would be would be really helpful to hear because this is really meant for a broad audience. Or ideas about how you might use it in your own outreach to faculty, or you know, showing what uh, what Berkeley and research IT is up, is up to. May I ask? And thank you for the presentation and video. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious. Um, maybe a, a, a slightly different model for other use cases could see you know the data being transferred and parked once in the cloud. Um, I, I'm getting the impression that, that that part of this whole infrastructure is the ability to just move data, move data, move data, a lot of data quickly. If it were parked once in the cloud and you um, fired researchers fired up compute on demand next to the data, I mean that could be a different model. What are the kinds of projects where, where that's not a good model? Is it like, for example, the visualization where, where the data needs to be, you know, or the information needs to be, you know, generated and shown, you know, in your lap, so to speak? Or, or what are some distinctions for the use cases? Yeah, great question. That 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 you know, one of the things that I think we witnessed, and Jeff can speak to this too, is that the team was continually innovating around these models. So initially, it was about moving data really quickly to compute. But then mm -hmm. as they started really exploring containerization, it was really about moving compute to data. Would you agree, Jeff? Yeah, absolutely. And while the, you know, the product of, of visualization infrastructure has got to be rendering, um, we did a lot of the, uh, the heavy lifting on the computation of the, of the data that were collected by the scientists. Um, not by moving the data, but by actually moving the computation to the data. And Got that's it. kind of what Nautilus is all about. Um, people don't really know when they upload their, their data to um, Nautilus uh, and the Ceph uh, storage architecture, they don't even know where it's at. They just know that they have a container, it's running on this GPU and their data are available. Um, so, you're, you're correct, Greg, to, to characterize it initially just as a, a data movement problem. And that wasn't trivial because the network is as complex as the network gets, especially if you go beyond the edge of the campus network uh -huh. um, and deep into the campus itself. Um, so what, but once that was solved, then all kinds of other possibilities emerged and, and the visualization is one possibility, people training machine learning uh, models um, on big data sets or other possibilities. So we're, we're past the network stack and we're in the application layer now. Cool, thank you very much. Hey, and you even spelled my name correctly. Good job, thank happy you. Happy day. <laughs> All right, well, we are at time. So thank you everybody for coming. This was fascinating, really loved the video. It was terrific and um, I will see many of you in the CIO's open forum on our next Zoom channel and the rest of you hope to see you next month. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Great to see everyone.